folks, here's a beautiful recording of ours called That's My Home. My name's Ricky Riccardi. I'm Director of Research Collections for the Louis Armstrong House Museum and Archives. Located in Queens, New York. Uh, it's the world's largest archives for any single jazz musician. We have Louis Armstrong stuff, his trumpets, and all materials devoted to Armstrong. Uh, Louis Armstrong is a trumpet player, uh, one of the greatest musicians of all time. To me, he's the biggest influence on 20th century music because not only uh, did he influence jazz, not only was he a great trumpet player, but he was equally influential as a singer. Oh, Diamond, is anyone finer in the state of Carolina? If there is, then you know, show to me. Armstrong, from a musical standpoint, it's the highest level of virtuosity, but it's so accessible that anybody can listen to it. There's something so melodic and beautiful about it, but at the same time, the stuff he's pulling off is like the height of virtuosity, so it's usually you don't find that combination. Usually something so virtuosic is above the heads of the masses. So Armstrong was born in New Orleans in the most poverty-ridden section. It was actually called the battlefield. That's how dangerous it was. And let's not mince words here. The man was, you know, born in the South, African-American, born in 1901. So he experienced this country at its worst. So that kind of poor upbringing, that childhood he had, as famous as Armstrong got, uh, he never let it get to his head, and he never let it take away from how much uh, he lived to play music for his audiences. Louis Armstrong moved to Corona, Queens in 1943, and he lived there for the last 20 years of his life. He refused to move. He saved everything he could possibly save. He died in 1971. His wife died in 1983. And uh, they left the, the house to the city of New York. It was declared a National Historic Landmark. And then the house, after a $5 million restoration, was opened to the public in 2003. So in the house, uh, there's a painting of Armstrong by Tony Bennett. There's his original reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. We have pages out from his index books where he would number each individual reel. His alcohol, <laughs> his beverages of choice, uh, and the blue kitchen. If anyone comes to the house, you don't want to miss the blue kitchen. Uh, which apparently was Lucille's favorite color, but it looks like this kind of World's Fair type of kitchen of the future. And we actually get people who visit the house who aren't even really Armstrong fans or jazz fans. They just want to see this perfectly preserved home. And so it's, it's all there at the house museum. At the archives, we now have 12 collections devoted to Armstrong. So we have his personal stuff, his reel-to-reel -reel tapes, his scrapbooks, his manuscripts, his letters, all that stuff, sheet music, arrangements, which is wonderful, trumpets, mouthpieces. There is the sense that early 20th century entertainment is kind of vanishing. Uh, where we are lucky is that there's still immense interest in Armstrong, but we're especially lucky that he was his own curator. So to give you an example, in 1950, he gets his first tape recorder. And between December 1950 and July 1971, literally the night before he died, he makes reel-to-reel -reel tapes. We have about 700 of these reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And about half of them are spoken word tapes where you hear him being interviewed, you hear him cursing, you hear him arguing with his wife. In fact, my favorite tape is Lewis arguing with his wife and she doesn't know he's tape recording it. And she calls him out on it and she tells him to erase that tape. Turn your tape off. In fact, ra erase out some of that <laughs> and he says, no, it's for posterity. That's for posterity. Posterity, my So to me, that two-word phrase, for posterity, means that Armstrong knew how important he was. But we are sitting here in 2019, so how many people know who Louis Armstrong is? They might know what a wonderful world. Do they know who's singing it? Do they know why he's so important? That's my job. So I live in Tom's River, New Jersey, Jersey Shore. Live there with my wife, three daughters. Uh, a typical day for me, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I leave the house about 4.30. I'm pretty much commuting, I would say five to five and a half hours a day. I've done it for 10 years now. It gets, it gets to me at times. And so I don't like to talk about it. I just wake up, check my calendar, and full speed ahead. And if that's what I have to do to live this life, then that's what I have to do. The fact that I call it work, I can call it a job, 
is something I do not take for granted. I was never the most popular person in high school. You know, I always had my very unique interests. Just seeing this guy kind of go through life without letting criticisms bother him, without letting anything stop him from creating joy. I think that's kind of what I grabbed onto early on. If you do find something you love, it could be something as obscure as, you know, a musician who died 50 years ago, or it could be whatever. If you treat it seriously, if you treat it with passion, people will respond. You know, I have devoted 24 years of my life to this guy's music, his legacy, and his life. And I'm not going to stop until uh, you know until the world feels the same way I do. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but I'm just the most thankful human being on the world that I get to do it. Well, I